Welcome to Talk Purpose and Truth, shifting you into higher consciousness, a show that elevates, uplifts, and encourages listeners to grow, heal, awaken, and evolve. Eden and Kim include bold topics, interviews with inspiring guests, experts, and celebrities, intuitive readings, channeled messages, mental health awareness, and hot topics to expand your awareness. Tune in for unprecedented truth, authenticity, on-purpose discussions, and magic. Who were using it. In fact, you can't even find heroin now because all they're doing is smoking fentanyl now. But they opened up this whole new market where you found the perfect distribution system as well, which is through these cell phones. Drug dealing went from brick and mortar buildings onto social media apps like Instagram, Meta, Snapchat, WeChat, Telegram, WhatsApp, uh, TikTok, and now Twitter from what I understand. So the distribution method became that much more prevalent and so easy to get. It's not like a 13, 14, 15 year old kid is not going to take a bus down to Skid Row and look for fentanyl or look for pills or look for weed. They're not going to do that. They're too yeah. scared. And yeah. I would be too. And I'm 60 years old. But when you have uh, as something as inoffensive, quote unquote, inoffensive as a smartphone, you can just go on there, uh, type in Oxy, hashtag Oxy. And, but now if you misspell, if you type in hashtag Oxy, you won't get anything. But if you misspell it, you'll, it'll take you to a plug. It'll take you to somebody that can furnish the drugs to you directly. So what we're looking at is we're looking at a, a crisis of epic proportions because now we have drugs available to kids as young as 11, 12, 13, 14 years old. And what's happening is that they don't have this information. They think that anything that is bought online is a pharmaceutical grade opioid. Bill Bodner, special agent in charge at the Los Angeles DEA office, has said that 100%, 100% of all pills bought on social media apps are fake and 40 to 50 percent of them are potentially lethal in other words you are playing russian roulette with practically a loaded gun yeah and the problem is is that if you consume the pill and you don't die you're almost automatically hooked because three and a half hours, four hours after consuming fentanyl, your body starts craving it, your mind starts craving it, your conscience starts craving it, which is what the cartels wanted in the first place. Yeah. I get asked a lot, well, why would the cartels want to kill off their customer yeah. base? Yeah, I was <laughs> thinking that too. They're yeah. not trying to kill off their customer base. What they want is they want their customer base to be addicted. They want yeah. them to be hooked. Wow. I know about whether in South Carolina, her young uh, son, 14 years old, broke his ankle in uh, high school football. He was prescribed opioids. He became hooked on those opioids. When he turned the spigot off, he went to fentanyl. Now we have a 15-year-old boy, homeless, completely huh. addicted to drugs on the streets of South Carolina. Wow. I mean, you think about that. And that's how horrific this is. So, Which is why I go back to the stigma of addiction and overdose. You have to knock down the stigma of addiction and overdose. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to, yeah. to, um, to do something about this epic crisis because more children are going to die. There's been a 300% increase in children's deaths between the ages of 11 and 17 from 2020 to 2021. Wow. We've been, we've been trying to shut down uh, the way these drug dealers sell their drugs on social media apps like Snapchat and things like that. Actually, I'm on the advisory board of the Alliance to Counter Crime Online, which is a Washington think tank that, wow. has, that has been fighting social media harms for, against children for many, many years. And they claim Section 230C protections. So they're, they're free speech issue. So right. they continue doing. But there's some, some chinks in the armor. We're making some headway. And it's just heartbreaking, you know. And, and here in my town of Santa Clarita, a month ago or a month and a half ago, a young 17 year old girl that concerts at the park. We have concerts at mm -hmm. Central Park. Yeah. You know, from what I understand, I did a line of cocaine and dropped dead right there. Oh. Right there. Just dropped dead. And that week, there was eight other drug deaths in Santa Clarita. Nobody talked about it. Wow. And it's very pervasive. It's happening on a daily basis. 
finally people are starting to wake up a little bit. Yeah. And then there's the other side to it that I, I always feel like, I don't know, closely connected to is that um, the stigma of mental health is also an issue because Mm -hmm. kids, kids don't tell their parents that they're depressed or uh, that they don't feel good, that something's wrong. Um, So that to begin with is, is an issue. The parents are not seeing that. And there's not even enough help out there either. There's been a 175% increase in teenage uh, harmful uh, activity, like cutting, plucking their eyebrows out, pulling their hair out. Yeah. Um, You know, there's a lot of mental, and it's all, I can tell you right now, and I'm not a doctor, but most mental health issues can all be tied back to social media and the internet for some reason. Oh, yeah. I've seen it in my own home with the bullying online. Um, I had grown, I had mothers out here in Santa Cruz calling me. I have a grown man sending pictures of his private parts to my 11 year old daughter. Mm -hmm. How does that happen? Yep. My daughter's friends went through that. You know, it's just insane that you have Mm -hmm. these perverts out there, you know, able to do things like that. But you're absolutely right. You know, you have to say, Eden, that mental health issues in our, on this generation of children, it's much higher than ever before. I am 60 years old. Yeah. And when I graduated out of Burbank High back in 1980, I had never heard of anybody suffering from ADHD, ADD. Mm-hmm. I never heard of any of my friends taking Ritalin or Adderall yeah. or, or Xanax or Lexapro or, or the list of, of psychosomatic drugs that people take to, 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 mm-hmm. to control their thoughts and, and their ways. I just never heard of it. And now you hear about it all the time. Yeah. Daniel suffered from ADHD and he suffered from severe depression and it's in my family. It's both. Uh, unfortunately, he got the double whammy. He got it both from mom's side and dad's side mm. and um, which was a highly contributing factor to his death. That being said, uh, even though he had made a, a terrible decision of going online and purchasing what he thought was an oxycodone pill, he certainly did not deserve to die for it. No. You know, I mean, if this stuff was back around back in the 70s or 80s, I, I think like 90% of Burbank High would be gone right. <laughs> easily. Yeah. I mean, I had a lot of friends who partied. I mean, I maybe the only ones who would be alive would be the Hoxie twins, Abrahamian, and that's about it. And maybe the Montantes, but that's about it. <laughs> something yeah. to laugh about I guess it's yeah you have to sometimes for but yeah I mean it is it is so it's such an epidemic and it's so different you know and we have to stop that from continuing worsening and worsening and so that's so good everything you're doing even though it you know it's the, the reason is not good um but what what you guys were saying about the mental health stigma and the addiction stigma I think the more we can have conversations about it mm-hmm. and the more that other people be vulnerable and admit it, you know, admit that stuff has been happening and stuff's been going on and and celebrities, you know, go out and admit it. Then I think that it starts to make kids feel like, oh, it's okay. Like, like someone like Sean Mendes talking about, you know, having a lot of mental health struggles, for example, that's great because then other kids go, oh, well he did. So I could talk about it too. So I think more and more of that needs to happen. Yeah. It's nothing to be absolutely ashamed of. I, me and yeah. Daniel worked together. I mean, we had very frank conversations. Uh, he was my best friend, but he knew I was his dad at the same time. Hmm. Um, so you you did, you, you were, sounds like you did everything you, you needed to do as a, as a father. I did everything that I needed yeah. to do, except yeah. I did not know about fentanyl. Right. And it's just right. the whole thing, you know. Uh, right. Fentanyl changes everything, but for fentanyl, our children would still be alive. Yeah. And if, and fentanyl is basically a problem that most people don't realize that's even out there. But I must say that these last days, there's been a huge, huge Increase. uptick in the yeah. conversation on both the national and local uh-huh. level. And, uh-huh. I th- and I think more so because of the rainbow fentanyl that we're seeing now, but we could talk about that a little bit later if you'd like, but yeah, what I wanted to also bring up too is the um, you you shared a story with me when we were talking on the phone um, about another family and um, what happened with that their child, um, and then also that you 
you talked about how um, when kids go to rehab um, that they can check themselves out. And what, what do some parents do with that? So, uh, like, uh, so Amy Neville, who is uh, the vice president of our foundation, um, uh, her son, uh, Alex Neville, a 14 year old kid, knucklehead kid from Aliso Viejo, a skateboarder at the skate park, you know, where lots of weed is smoked. And, and this is a kid who was very interested in drugs since he was in first grade. And I'm not saying this, I'm just repeating what she said. And so yeah. she knew she was going to have a problem with this kid when, when he was later on. And he was just one of those kids who was the drugs would do to you. So she knew they were, they were having Frank and not only that, but he also suffered from anxiety as well. He had an anxiety disorder. Tell him weed say, Hey, look, well, you know, if you're suffering from anxiety, I got these, I got these pills. Why don't you try these out? And he had actually done a, um, had studied what ox what the effects of oxycodone were oxycodone is just another form of morphine you know quite frankly mm -hmm. right so um five days he started consuming these pills on a sunday night he walks down the stairs goes mom dad i got to talk to you i started taking these pills a week ago and they have a hold on me like never before and i can't stop and i need help i need help and i need to go somewhere and so she called a rehab that night. That rehab center couldn't do anything for them that evening. They said, well, we'll call you tomorrow at eight o'clock. Unfortunately, the next day when she walked into his bedroom, she found him uh, slumped over on the floor um, uh, at 730 in the morning and he was dead. California laws are, God, I don't want to get political. I, I'll, I'll do my best not to get political. <laughs> Let me just say that uh, they don't favor parents very well. Yeah. Uh, so they claim HIPAA for children as well. So like when Daniel was going through his crises much before this, uh, before he died, when I knew that he was uh, smoking marijuana, um, I took him to Kaiser and I wanted him to have a urine analysis. And I wanted to see what exactly was in his urine. I wanted to see if he was taking anything else besides marijuana, because that's what a father and a mother should do. You should be on top of your children and whether they like it or not, it's your right, you're the parent, you get to see what the hell they're consuming, period. Mm -hmm. Kaiser would not give me the results. They yeah. would never give me the results based on HIPAA. Yeah. And if I had wanted to put Daniel in any kind of rehab, which I didn't have to, I mean, they can check themselves out in the state of California. Yeah. So. Um, and it's, it's not the only story I've heard. I've heard it uh, because uh, understand again, that fentanyl changes everything. And the first time that you consume it, you're hooked. And it's like, that's, and what's, that's what the cartels want. They want your kids hooked to this stuff. They're going to find the money and they're going to keep going back for more and more and more. You go to the Tenderloin district of, of, of San Francisco, you go to Skid Row and it's just heartbreaking or go down to Venice beach where a lot of these young kids are at. I'm mm -hmm. talking 14, 15, 16 years old, mm. already homeless and doing drugs. And then you think to yourself, where do these kids come from? What is happening here? And mm -hmm. how as a society are we allowing this to happen? And unfortunately, the politics of it, we have people who say, well, you know, uh, this is a mental, uh, uh, a mental health disorder of a kind, and it's, it's, it's substance use disorder. And therefore, instead of stigmatizing it what we should do is we should uh, enable it to a certain extent and i know for example in the tenderloin district the department of health services was handing out tinfoil and straws to the addicts so they could smoke the fentanyl instead of shooting it up you know which Sorry, is does that make a difference it's it doesn't make much well if they do it intravenously it's it could be um it could be deadlier i guess per se uh -huh. <laughs> but it, it, it's a very complex situation. Yeah. It's a very political, we need political will. It's, you know, I can go down to, you know, they talk about housing. This isn't a housing problem. This is a drug addiction problem. 
and these people need help. And 30 days of rehab is not going to do the trick. And unfortunately, most right. people don't have money to spend on a 10, 15, $20,000 a month rehab. Right. Yeah. It's only available to the uber rich. So right. a lot of people, I mean, people who have the means, uh, so their kids can't check themselves out. What they're actually doing is they're sending them to, uh, to Mexico yeah. mm-hmm. and paying $2,000 a month for a rehab where they can't leave. Mm-hmm. That's well, you, good that they have yeah, that. You, yeah. At least that. You, but yeah, yeah, it's sad. Cause I know, you know, I know people, I, I had to get sober from alcohol because I was self-medicating. So I was having hormonal stuff going on and I chose to get sober, but I know people, you know, that, that have had drug struggles that are friends with people that are desperate and they don't have any money and they go to the hospital and the hospital doesn't, they do something for maybe 24 hours and then they send them back home and then they don't have anywhere to go. Like there's no quality places if they can't afford it. Thank you for listening to talk purpose and truth podcast. Find out more at talkpurposeandtruth.com and follow us at talk purpose, truth, Instagram and Facebook.